Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak today on the important subject of retained firefighters. I am also grateful to you for allowing me to give up some of my time at the end of my speech to three of my honourable friends who I know care deeply about this subject and how it impacts on their constituents. Before I start, I would like to make it very clear that this debate is about retained firefighters, and I will limit myself to that part of the fire and rescue services, but this should in no way be seen as a snub to our brave and dedicated whole-time firefighters. I believe the retained system complements the whole-time system and that each need the other, but a debate on whole-time firefighters is for another occasion. Retained firefighters, sometimes called on-call firefighters, are also referred to as the retained duty system, or RDS for short. And in the interest of brevity, I will at times use this abbreviation during my speech. Mr Deputy Speaker, the subject of this debate is the role of retained firefighters, but in many ways it is about much more than that. It is about communities, it is about volunteering, and it is about service to family, to neighbourhoods and to country. Retained firefighters are paid volunteers who spend up to 120 hours per week on call from home or from work. The majority fulfil this impressive commitment in addition to a paid day job. It is not the sort of thing that anyone does for money. These are local people who care about their neighbourhoods and who want to play a role in keeping them safe. The concept of volunteer service is a noble one that extends across many areas of national life and it is one that I believe should be cherished. It predates the big society, but dare I say it, complements it nicely in the spirit of Edmund Burke's Little Platoons. It is the territorial army soldier giving up his weekends and his summer holidays to train alongside the regular army, taking time out from his job to deploy on operations to serve his country, and all too often giving his life in the process. It is the police special finishing her day job on a Friday evening and instead of going out with friends, putting on a police uniform and going out on patrol with her local police, helping to keep her neighbourhood safe. And it is the retained firefighter, dedicating his life to the bleeper, standing ready to respond within five minutes of a call out, day or night. And once that bleeper goes off and the RDS crew mobilise at the fire station, they are firefighters. They wear the same uniform, use the same equipment and vehicles and attend the same incidents as their whole-time colleagues. The fire service could not function without them in its current form. Looking at the origins of the fire service in the UK, it could be said that the entire fire and rescue service developed out of an early version of the retained fire service. Prior to the Great Fire of London in 1666, firefighting was done in a haphazard way at local parish level and was principally carried out by townsfolk working together to extinguish fires in their communities. Following, 19, uh, following 1666, local fire services started to become more organised, but it wasn't until the 1800s that more formal fire brigades began to evolve. Even then, some remained volunteer brigades, while others were private organisations formed by property insurers. The first national legislation wasn't seen until 1938, when first the Auxiliary Fire Service and then the National Fire Service was formed. After World War II, the National Fire Service was taken over by local county authorities, and in 1948, there were 148 county council and county borough-run fire brigades. Today, across the UK, we have 63 brigades, and with the exception of London, almost all of them include RDS personnel. Mr Deputy Speaker, the RDS system as it stands is not perfect, and there is much that can be done to improve it. Issues surrounding training, concerns over the EU Working Time Directive, and difficulties with recruitment and retention remain of concern. Following the 2003 White Paper, Our Fire and Rescue Service, a review of the retained system was commissioned. It was published in 2005 and made 51 specific recommendations aimed at improving the effectiveness of the retained duty system. But it is worth noting, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the report opened with the words, the retained duty system is a valued, vital element of the modern fire and rescue service. While the previous government was perhaps a little slow in starting to implement the recommendations, the picture has clearly improved in recent years with, for example, 
a reduction in vacancies in retained duty system posts from 20% in 2003 to 4 to 13% in 2008 to 9. But there is more work to do, and those recommendations from the 2005 retained review that remain outstanding should be looked at in detail by the Coalition Government. Mr Deputy Speaker, this debate is about the retained fire service in general, but it is well known in the House that I and my fellow Warwickshire MPs have a number of concerns relating to changes in the provision of fire and rescue services in Warwickshire in particular. Yeah. My, in my own constituency, the fire station in the town of Bedworth has faced the uncertainty of potential closure for many months. We have only recently learned the details of options the County Council will be considering next week, and I know that many people in Bedworth will be relieved and delighted that it appears Bedworth Fire Station will now remain open. I know that other fire stations in Warwickshire have not been so fortunate. From what we know, it appears that Bedworth Fire Station will, in future, be manned exclusively by RDS personnel, and so the decision is both timely and relevant to this debate. I recognise that many people in Bedworth will remain concerned at what could be seen as a reduction in the capacity of the station. I confess to holding mixed views. I would have preferred the station to have remained as it was, but, Mr Deputy Speaker, I also recognise that in Bedworth, the hard work the campaigning and the clear message that local people sent to the Chief Fire Officer have resulted in probably the best compromise we could have hoped for. The worst possible outcome for us, an outcome which looked like a very real possibility for a long time, would have been better losing our fire station altogether. As it is, it looks as though we will end up with a compromise. Better fire station staying open, but as a retained station. In doing so, it will join the 54% of all fire stations in the UK that are manned solely by RDS firefighters. So it is with mixed feelings that I declare my delight that people power seems to have won the day. And Bedworth will continue to have our own fire station. It is a testament to the hard work and campaigning of so many local people, including the Fire Brigade Union and the Retained Firefighters Union, the friends and family of local firefighters, and many others. And I am proud to have played the role that I did in helping to save Better Fire Station. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm making quicker progress than I expected. It might be that one or two others might wish to speak for a little longer than two minutes. But before I conclude, I'm not a big fan of lists of statistics. But sometimes, even in this place, a few facts can be helpful to a debate. So I hope the House will indulge me. Of the 42,000 firefighters in England, around one-third of them are retained firefighters. But even this statistic masks just how much we rely on these volunteers. Retained firefighters are responsible for operating 60% of all fire engines in England. Because retained firefighters are more prevalent in rural areas, a staggering 90% of the land mass of the UK has emergency cover provided by the RDS. 54% of all fire stations in the UK are manned solely by RDS firefighters. And at any one time in England, there are more retained firefighters on call and providing emergency cover than there are full-time firefighters. In conclusion, I think it is clear, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we rely on our retained firefighters in a way that few casual observers of our emergency services would realise. But they can only continue to support us if we continue to support them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a, it's a pleasure to respond uh, to this debate, uh, and I congratulate my honourable friend, the member for North Warwickshire, both for having secured it, uh, secondly, for the very elegant uh, way in which, if I may say, uh, he uh, put his case, and for his generosity in allowing a number of other honourable members to participate as well. Uh, the recital of the history of the fire service um, uh, reminded me of my own rather lengthy association with that service, Though I have to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't go quite as far back as some of the uh, early reforms uh, that my honourable friend suggested, despite rumours sometimes to the contrary. Um, I I'm delighted uh, to uh, say that I agree uh, with my honourable friend about the importance of uh, the uh, fire service. Uh, I fully appreciate just how vital the retained duty system is to the effectiveness of emergency cover in many parts of the country particularly in protecting uh, our small towns and rural communities, 
and providing a crucial element of, nat of the national resilience arrangements. Retained duty system firefighters, as my honourable friends have said, make up over 30 per cent of the fire and rescue services operational personnel, provide crews to something like 54 per cent of all fire stations in England. Uh, as I said, Mr Deputy Speaker, in my speech to the fire conference in Harrogate at uh, the end of last month, the vital and significant contribution of the retained duty system provides an excellent example of how localism and the big society are already embedded within parts of the fire service. And again, I welcome uh, that recognition from honourable members who spoke in the debate. So I can confirm that the government greatly values the contribution of firefighters employed on the retained duty system. They are the backbone of many services, in some cases over 70 per cent of the operational workforce. That's the point I had the pleasure of making directly uh, to the national officers of the Retained Firefighters Union when I met them as an early priority uh, after uh, my uh, appointment. Uh, across the country, it's right that, they, uh, as is said, they undertake a wide range of roles. They're responding to emergencies of all kinds, heathland fires, floods, ship fires, chemical spills. Many are also involved in the delivery of community fire safety advice, and others take part in the co-responding programme uh, as first responders in the case of medical emergencies uh, such as heart attacks. They bring great flexibility uh, and uh, uh, value for money to our system. Uh, as uh, active members of uh, the community, uh, retained duty crews provide an excellent demonstration of the uh, effectiveness of the localist approach to service delivery, uh, and I agree, they are dedicated, highly motivated men and women who are doing an excellent job uh, for their communities. Uh, it is right that in some parts of the country uh, the system has been affected by some long-standing recruitment and retention difficulties, but a number of measures are now available that I hope will help to support the fire and rescue services in overcoming those challenges. We do have to recognise, I think, that, that no one-size solution fits all in what can be quite complex local issues, particularly with the way that changes have happened in the, in the way rural life. Uh, is sometimes organised, uh, and social changes in areas uh, served by the retained duty system uh, and the pressures that compete upon uh, busy people uh, for their time. Uh, but uh, that's led to initiatives being developed, such as the development of an employer's information toolkit uh, for fire and rescue services to use in establishing and building links with businesses in their community, uh, and an employer's recognition scheme designed uh, to be run locally by uh, fire and rescue services to acknowledge the contribution that's made uh, by employers in their area who release uh, staff for retained, uh, duty, uh, retained uh, duty systems. Uh, we are undertaking an extensive survey uh, of the retained duty system, looking at how the nature of the retained role may have changed in recent years, uh, how demographic changes uh, may be impacting uh, uh, upon that, as with the economic situation, how the service is addressing recruitment and retention and managing those pressures, how the RDS workforce uh, is uh, trained, developed uh, and uh, utilised. That survey will deliver vital evidence that will inform discussions by fire and rescue authorities on issues affecting this valued sector of uh, the workforce. Uh, so too, I believe, will the proposed strategic review uh, of the fire service that I announced at the uh, Harrogate conference uh, as well. I hope that we will use the opportunity of the survey and the review uh, to encourage uh, fire and rescue authorities to make more imaginative use uh, of uh, the resource uh, of the retained duty uh, fire fighters. It is necessary just to say a word, Mr Deputy Speaker, about the economic uh, background to which the service, uh, has to, uh, deal, with which the service has to deal. The budget on the 22nd of June set out the Government's five-year plan uh, to rebuild the British economy based on our response, uh, values of responsibility, freedom uh, and fairness. It shows how we will carry out Britain's unavoidable deficit reduction plan uh, in a way that strengthens and unites the country. In, in these challenging times, the Fire and Rescue Service, alongside other public service providers, will have an important role to play in helping to deliver the spending reductions. We will look to the sector to be innovative, both in making savings uh, and uh, in improving efficiencies, whilst at the same time recognising that its core business is a frontline uh, role, uh, which uh, must, of course, be uh, given appropriate priority. 
It's therefore right that many of the proposals contained in integrated risk management plans across the country, not just in Warwickshire, which has been referred to here, are aimed at increasing efficiency, because by doing so, fire and rescue authorities can uh, maximise the amount of risk-reducing activity that they can deliver for the resources available to them. And that's the key point. The aim should still be to ensure excellent service delivery. Efficiency is about working more effectively, using less public money uh, to deliver as good or better public services. That means that despite uh, uh, reductions in spending, there should not be a visible reduction in service uh, nor a reduction in performance. There will be difficult decisions to be made, but the Fire and Rescue Service has a track record of delivery uh, and uh, it's uh, where the service is, I'm sure, going to step up to the mark uh, uh, to deal with this. Uh, my honourable friend and the other honourable members who have spoken uh, in this debate uh, have referred to the position in Warwickshire, and I understand uh, why uh, they have done so. I also note in passing that present in his place and keeping me company on the Treasury bench he is my honourable friend, the member for Kenilworth, uh, whose position does not permit him to take part in the debate, but who I know takes an active interest uh, in this matter uh, as a Warwickshire uh, member of uh, Parliament. Uh, I have uh, uh, spoken uh, uh, at the at length about the overall position of the duty system. Uh, obviously, my honourable friends have referred uh, to the uh, proposals in Warwickshire uh, and the possible closure of some fire stations which are part of uh, those proposals. As my right honourable friends will recall, the implications of the changes set out in Warwickshire Fire and Rescue Authority's improvement plan were debated on West in Westminster Hall on the 30th of June. Uh, I'm sure uh, that Warwickshire County Council in making its decision will take into account all the views expressed during the consultation exercise and I have no doubt that my honourable friends uh, who have spoken powerfully tonight will make sure uh, that their views uh, are available and taken into account by the authorities. I am sure as a responsible fire authority it will when it comes uh, to its uh, decision. Uh, but Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, as I explained uh, in the earlier debate, it will be inappropriate for Ministers uh, to comment on the specific proposals which have been put forward and consulted upon uh, by Warwickshire Fire and Rescue uh, Authority. And that, that very principle of local determination uh, of local solutions to local circumstances means that it wouldn't be appropriate uh, for me to seek to influence the decisions uh, which the authority will be faced with uh, on the 20th of July uh, in the light of the representations uh, to them. The whole point of the uh, locally determined risk approach is that it's for the local authorities to take those decisions, uh, and I have confidence that local authorities will do so uh, responsibly. I'm sure my honourable friends will understand why it's not appropriate for me to say more on the specifics, uh, but they have ventilated their case uh, with, uh, with vigour. Uh, I just want to close by saying this, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, if I may. Earlier today, uh, I was at Winchester Cathedral representing Her Majesty's Government at the memorial service for two brave firefighters who died on duty uh, in Southampton. Uh, they were full-time firefighters, but the risks that are run by firefighters draw no distinction between those who are full-time and those who are retained. We have seen the tragic deaths of retained firefighters in recent times as well. All of them, every one of them, are brave and courageous women doing their best for this country, and they deserve our support. Order, order. The House.